In later parts of Jimmy Little's life, Preacher Jimmy's life, he began to be spoken to by God. He started out by speaking to God, first answering the call to be saved, then speaking to God, asking for requests. But the time really did come when God spoke to him. Here's a story that G.T. Little tells uh, about how he went and preached at a ball game. He said, I was sitting down in the church on the porch. Of the little hotel. Uh, yeah, and I had my feet up on the banister and said, looked like the whole town come by. And they didn't know him. said, ain't you going out to the ball game? He said, no, sir. And he said, they just kept on, people stopping. Seen him sitting there and they wonder why I wasn't going. He said directly, he said, the Lord said, go. He just got up and went on to the ball game. And whenever they got to hollering and going, he said, I just forgot myself. First thing I know, I was preaching. And there's 22 souls saved there in the ballpark. It just broke the ball game up. Oh, my goodness. Jimmy Little was used to being uh, not too planned. Let me give you an example. He was in a church at Mineral Springs in Anson County, I understand, from some of the people around. And two young men at the middle of the service got up and left. Preacher Jimmy Little said, wait a minute. Y'all excuse me for a minute. I'll be back in a second. He went outside and got those two boys and brought them in by the scruff of the neck, set them back down in the seat, said, now don't you move, and finished his service. But he had another situation happen that's much more serious, I think, and yet it's a little funny, too, in South Carolina with what I have begun to call the gospel hound dog. G.T. Little tells the story. These men wouldn't come to church. They'd go back to an old store building up there and sit and gamble. And uh, he, uh, Preacher Jimmy went to him a time or two every day. I mean, one every day for a time or two. And, and tried to get them to come to church. Well, they, they wouldn't promise them they'd come. They wouldn't, they wouldn't come and say they wouldn't. But one night, anyhow, they run it a week, and Preacher Martin said he, he was wanting to quit. Said Preacher Jimmy said, I ain't going to close this meeting until any man comes to church. And on Tuesday night, the next week, he was up for preaching, and an old dog come in, <laughs> hound dog come in, and, and walked up and lay down on the on the pulpit. I mean, on the rostrum there. And they said that, that that man grabbed that dog up and threw him out through the window, and knocked the old window sash out, and didn't even break his speed of preaching. Preached right on, just the same as if he hadn't hadn't done that. And the next night, every one of them men was out here and preached. <laughs> so the dog got their attention. I hope the window was open as we showed in the picture, and I hope the dog was not hurt, and I'm sure he wasn't. But the point of the matter was that Jimmy Little heard the Lord say, throw the dog, and he did. And the men that he was praying for came to church. One of the most famous elements, though, in Jimmy Little's life has to do with Rocky River Springs. Rocky River Springs was a resort uh, in the area that many people went to during the 4th of July and other warm areas. You can see here this picture from a brochure shows a couple of the buildings at Rocky River Springs. None of those are there today. That's all changed. But some interesting things happened at Rocky River Springs, and I want us to think about them for a few minutes. During the research we did for this video, I talked to several people who were there when the dance hall fell. That's the most popular story about Jimmy Little in this entire area. And Mr. Fred Balkum is going to tell us a little bit about Rocky River Springs, and then we're going to hear about how the dance hall actually fell and what happened to make it fall. Approximately on that right on the site where the pavilion was built, and approximately the distance right down in here where, the, where it fell, and right over here is where the preacher Jimmy Little knelt down and prayed for the, for the stopping from dancing so he could preach. And... I'm standing just about the sound of the vision. Ms. Ruth Bennett, who is an excellent researcher and has helped me a lot with this production, among a lot of other people, talks about the dance hall as well. Let's see what she has to say. Why do you think the floor fell in the dance hall? Well, there are two opinions there. One was a result of his prayer. The other was maybe too much weight was on the floor. 
But the wait was there before he prayed. There was a dance going on, and Preacher Jimmy Little prayed, and the floor fell right after the prayer. Let's listen to what some other people said. One person, Mrs. Lee Carpenter's father, went under the place to check the, 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 the uh, sills or the wooden stru uh, structure under the building and found out something. Let's see what she found out. My daddy, Charlie Balcom, was over at Rocky River Springs when the, the incident happened that the church preacher Jimmy Little prayed for the building, you know, to fall in. He was out in the front of the building and when it fell in, he went around and looked under there, and he said those seals was just as sound as a dollar, and he couldn't see any reason other than the faith the preacher had from falling in. He said that, that I was standing right in two foot of preacher Jamie when he was praying, and, and he said she went down, and there wasn't no fault of the timber. The timber just couldn't take the pressure that was put on it. For the good Lord, he, he, he can turn the world upside down. Another person, Mr. Burgess, was there, and he tells us why he believes the building fell at the very time that Preacher Little prayed. Let's listen to him. Standing around there listening to the Preacher preach, and we heard a big slam, and so uh, most of the people run up there. I didn't go uh, right then, but... Uh, before that, he had prayed for that bus to stop up there. And when that slam come down, why it broke in, you know, it all fell to the bottom. So uh, his prayer was answered. Do you, th you think that the prayer caused it to fall? Well, uh, yeah, I, I believe in prayer that much. I believe it, it caused it to fall. Because they were making such a fuss, you know, he he couldn't, well, the people couldn't hear him preaching. And I suppose it was about a couple hundred feet from where he was preaching up to the place, the dance hall. So uh, when it fell in, uh, he preached right on, but most of his crowd went up to see what happened. I think the lightning in the dance hall are things that introduced the third phase a preacher Jimmy Little's life. This point was a time of mighty power, and this was a time that few of us may really understand. But Fred Balcom talks about a time when he was preaching and the jail doors couldn't keep him in. Let's see what Mr. Balcom has to say. So he'd go to Charlotte and uh, get on the street corner and preach. Of course, as they passed the new ordinance up by then, he could have could have preached on the street and called it gather people up in a crowd, you know, and get it away and run over a wagon. It wasn't a buggy at those times, but cars. And a uh, policeman arrested him and carried him down and put him in jail, locked him up. And a uh, policeman went on back up on his duty, on his beat. And he looked around, and I stood Jimmy Little. He'd done him out beat him up there. <laughs> and Jimmy said, I'll come in and preach. I'm going to preach. And I think he carried him back a second time. He, I've heard him tell it two or three times. Okay. G.T. Little tells a story that he has heard about another time the Lord spoke or, or divinely intervened in the life of Jimmy Little. This dealt with a revival and a bootlegger who was selling alcohol to people who ought to have been in church. And the, the young boys, this man was selling liquor, and the young boys was going up there and getting to drink the liquor before go to church and then they got disturbing the, the people in the church that uh, drinking. And uh, Preacher Jamie and Preacher Martin went up there to talk to him. Had one leg. And they talked to him about stopping it and witnessed to him. While they were sitting there, he reached over and got his jug of liquor and turned it up to his a gallon jug and took him a drink out of it and set it down. Said Preacher Jimmy, when, when the star leaves, he called him by name, but I can't call it. He says, I'm sorry that you feel like you do. But he said, the next time you turn that jug up to you to take a drink, you're going to die. And he said, the God told me that. And they said that when they went on out, Preacher Martin said, Preacher Jimmy, he said, I 
I wish you hadn't said that to him. He says, why did you say that? He said, I don't know why I said it. He said, God told me to say it. And, uh, and they went on out. And the next morning, somebody found the man who was dead in the bed. Another interesting story, similar to this, but somewhat different, deals with a man who came to Jimmy Little's house when it was cold and disagreeable outside, and what Jimmy Little did and what the Lord said to him. In the house was a fire. Somebody knocked on the door. He got up and opened the door for him. And there's a, so to speak, it's a beggar in those days, the way we call him, you know. And he asked him, would he let him come in warm? It was an awful cold day. And he told him, boy, sure, come on in. So they had their conversation. And we got ready to leave. He said, well, it's by the cold. He said, ain't you cold? Or ain't you cold? Like those clothes on? He said, he certainly was. So he went back and got an old overcoat he had it and discarded it, hung there in the closet. Went back and gave it to him, put it on him, said, now you can go your way, you'll stay keep warm. So he said, went on down the road, said, I kept bearing on his mind. Why did you give that old rag, wore out rag? Why did you give me a best coat? And he said, it's born his mind to bed, and he opened the door and run down the road and hollered. He hollered and called and said, hey, stop, come back. And so the fellow stopped. He said, what do you want? He said, you just come back to the house. I don't he got back to the house and said, pull off that coat. He said, Mister, I appreciate that coat. That coat will keep me warm. So he reached back in his closet and pulled out another one and used best coat. Go ahead and put that one on. And of course he said, now you can be on your way. That was about all he had to say about it. He said, the Lord would have just whooped him down so bad he gave him that old coat. What he's referring to is to give the best you had. Well, Mr. Balkum heard Preacher Little tell this story at Rocky Mount Church in Anson County. In June 1921, Preacher Little conducted his last revival. It was in Popeton. And during that time, he began to have another what they call spell with his heart, perhaps related to the lightning striking him some 20 years before, 13, 14 years before. At any rate, he was not able to preach after that. And on August the 14th, 1921, Jimmy Little died in the hospital in Charlotte. His funeral was held in Marshville at the Marshville Baptist Church, and his body lies in the Marshville Cemetery. 3,000 people came to his funeral. Remember, this is 1921, not much transportation. They had to come by foot or by train, and some few by automobile. Preacher Jimmy died like he lived witnessing for the Lord. The painting that you see on the screen shows his hand on his Bible. His Bible, and the reason I didn't show his big Bible a while ago, is that no one has it. It is buried with him in Marshville. His finger is to the scripture, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's an interesting thing, interesting story I heard about Jimmy Little while I was doing this research, and I heard it at second hand. But a friend of a person I was talking to said, you know, I wish I could hear old Jimmy Little again. I never experienced the Spirit of God except in his meetings. Well, Jimmy Little's gone. There's not a lot left. There's a Bible and a few letters and a photograph or two, most of which I have. But he lives in the hearts of the people. And he was the kind of man that I'd like to have known and he's the kind of man I think Christians today ought to try to be more like. To believe in Jesus, to go after him with all their heart, and to become men and women of prayer.